Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Top Daddy Big Hat here, welcoming you to another fun edition of Fighting Game Thursday. Throughout the 15 months I've been producing this weekly show, one franchise I've been asked to cover time and time again is, of course, Mortal Kombat. So today, I will finally answer your calling and deliver exactly what you have been after. Mortal Kombat over the years has been considered a very controversial series. This has at times caused me to be reluctant when it comes to providing coverage for the games in case the YouTube gods choose to smite me. Despite my reservations, I've decided to man up and give the people exactly what they want regardless and take a look at the out of control origins of the Mortal Kombat brand. The game did things that no title previously had dared to do, leading to some making the outrageous claim that the game was corrupting society itself. In this content we are going to analyse if there is any truth to these ridiculous claims and revisit the gameplay that the first entry in this infamous series offers. Is this a mechanically good fighting game? Or was Mortal Kombat more of a cash grab that simply relied on wowing players with tacky gore? Let's try and answer all of these questions today. This ladies and gentlemen is the mad story of Mortal Kombat and why it caused so much outrage. Yeah. As things stand today, Mortal Kombat is one of the most successful fighting game franchises of all time, with new entries in the series regularly being released right up until this very day. It truly is one of the most popular in the genre's history, resulting in sequels, spin-offs and even live action movies. This game is a true juggernaut, but its road to success has not always been easy. At the original arcade game's release way back in 1992, it would be very easy to assume that the game was made in response to the success of Street Fighter 2, an inference which would be easy to make considering the similarities between the two games paired with the fact that Street Fighter 2 came out a year earlier. What may come as a surprise to you though is that the game was in development prior to the release of Street Fighter 2 even existing, even if it perhaps did take influence from the game in later stages of its development. In terms of games that influenced the development of this American game by Midway, creators Ed Boon and John Tobias state that their drive to create a fighting game came from playing Karate Champ, released by Technos of Japan back in 1984. Karate Champ is considered to be the first ever one-on-one -on -one martial arts game, and its popularity would also spur the creation of the original Street Fighter game that was later published in 1987. Boone and Tobias wanted to create something like Karate Champ, but for a modern 90s audience, and envisioned they could do so by making a ninja-themed fighting game that featured large digitised characters. Initially, Midway would reject the proposal to allow Tobias and company to work on such a game, believing that one-on-one -on -one fighting was too simple and rudimentary to play a part in arcade gaming. Midway did however want to push forward with games featuring digitised characters, and instead the company desperately wanted to make an action game based around an upcoming movie known as Universal Soldier. The game they wanted would have featured a digitised version of Jean-Claude Van Damme as the main playable character, but sadly this plan fell apart due to the man already being in negotiations to star in a different game. Unfortunately though, neither project ever came to be. The lack of Van Damme for an action game paired with the success of Street Fighter 2 proving there was indeed a huge market for versus fighting games were the main catalysts that would convince Midway that maybe a game like Karate Champ with digitised characters could work. Development would commence with the game being designed by Ed Boon and John Tobias. Boon would handle the programming and Tobias alongside John Vogel would work as the game's main artists. After receiving the green light, Mortal Kombat would be created over a 10 month development cycle that ran between 1991 and 1992, and would stand out from other titles on the market due to the fact that real actors would be used as digitised sprites for the game, which was amusingly captured on Tobias's Hi8 camera. This feature meant that the game had a more realistic appeal than many titles that had come before it. Speaking of the realism, according to Tobias, the game's ultra-violent content had not been originally intended, and was only implemented gradually as the development progressed. 
The concept of fatalities in particular evolved from the dizzied mechanic in earlier fighting games such as Street Fighter 2. In regards to this, Boone mentioned that he was not a fan of dizzied mechanics as it functioned in no other capacity really other than getting in a free hit. Boone and Tobias decided they could eliminate the aggravation of getting dizzied by having it occur at the end of a fight after the outcome had already been decided, which would eventually evolve into the game's fatality system. In terms of the brutality itself behind these controversial finishes, their roots can be traced back to 1970s martial arts movies. The film known as The Street Fighter, released in 1974 for example, featured a character played by Sonny Chiba, who would perform an X-ray fatality finishing move, which was mainly placed in the movie as a gimmick to set it apart from the slew of other martial arts films on the market. 1983's Fist of the North Star anime and manga also had a character who had a specific gory fatality. Kenshito would attack opponents pressure points causing their heads and bodies to explode. Past this point these style manoeuvres would continue to pop up in media throughout Asia. When it comes to Mortal Kombat's fatalities, initially Tobias only wanted to give one character the move, the final boss Shang Tsung who was going to pull out his sword and behead his opponent. This idea would later spawn the idea of allowing all characters to be able to do these sort of moves for their opponents, including those controlled by the player. So overall combining this old kung fu movie trope with the creator's disdain for the dizzy mechanic would pave the way for the birth of the fatality. Nice. Midway through the game's development cycle, see what I did there, a demo version of the game would be ready to show off internally at the company. This version of the game would feature just six characters to choose from, but this simplified version of the game impressed management so much that they would give the team even more time to work on their game. This extra time would allow for the staff to refine the game further and increase its roster size, which would lead to the addition of Sonya Blade as the previous build of the game only had male characters. The final arcade version of the title looked beautiful, taking advantage of 8 megabytes of graphics data, with each character having 64 colours and around 300 frames of animation each. In terms of gameplay, the title functions as a one-on-one -on -one fighting game and features many of the conventions we today consider standard, such as two to three round encounters where fighters must compete to drain each other's life bars. Mortal Kombat took advantage of an eight-directional joystick and a fairly uncommon for its time five-button layout. There are two kicks and two punch buttons which are divided into high and low moves. Attacks though can also vary in this game based on the distance between competing figures. All characters have some shared moves such as leg sweeps and the franchise's well known uppercuts that launch opponents high into the air. But unique to each character special moves can be performed too by tapping the joystick and ending the sequence with a button press. Fighting in this game varies from Street Fighter and many other fighting games on the market in that few moves require more traditional circular joystick movements, giving the game a rather different feel to many others. The game's blocking system also sets the combat apart further. The game has a dedicated block button which allows players to take less damage from regular moves when held down. In addition though, blocks allow players to partially absorb the impact of moves without losing much ground when struck, making counter-attacks much easier after a successful block, and adding a further layer of strategy to the game. The game also pretty much pioneered juggling within the fighting game genre. The practice of knocking an opponent high into the air, then mid-air following up the attack with a combination of moves, while the enemy remains defenceless and still airborne. We have already touched on the game's fatality system earlier, and when fatalities can be performed, but I have not yet mentioned the mechanics behind them. Basically, in order to perform a fatality correctly, fighters must often stand a certain distance from their opponents, and be able to perform quick button press sequences in order to pull off the desired results. Each character has their own fatality, which must each be performed in a very specific way. Throughout a single player playthrough, the game also includes mini games between certain stages known as Test Your Might, where players can earn bonus points. These involve filling meters via rapid button presses to smash various materials. These mini games would go on to become another staple of the series. 
Like most fighting games, Mortal Kombat would feature a plot, providing the cast of the game a reason to fight. In the game's intro, it states that Shang Tsung was banished to Earthrealm 500 years previously, and with the help of the monstrous Goro, was able to seize control of the Mortal Kombat tournament in an attempt to doom the realm. For 500 years straight, Goro has been undefeated in the tournament, and now a new generation of warriors must challenge him. Prior to inserting a coin, players can learn biographical information about each of the game's characters, but further information is also provided upon completing the game with each character. When it comes to this game, the lineup of characters are as memorable as every other feature that would make this game stand out from the pack in 1992. Amongst these, we would have Liu Kang, a Shaolin monk and Earthrealm's chosen champion, who is dead set on defeating the evil sorcerer. We also have Sonya Blade, a special forces mercenary who has entered the tournament to pursue Kano, another playable fighter who is the leader of the Black Dragon International Crime Organization. Further to this we have Raiden, who is the God of Thunder who holds the divine role of protecting the Earthrealm. To add to the roster, the game would include the unforgettable Sub-Zero, a ninja who has the ability to freeze his opponents. The game would also include Scorpion, a yellow palette swap of Sub-Zero, a vengeful rival of him, whose family had been killed by the blue ninja. In terms of palette swaps, we also have a green palette swap of the fighter, a secret character known as Reptile. Perhaps the most amusing addition to the game though was Johnny Cage, a cocky movie star who was placed in the game to provide comic relief for the franchise. The character is a parody of Jean-Claude Van Damme, which is obviously a call back to the time when Midway wanted to make a Jean-Claude Van Damme action game in place of this fighter. Amusingly, Jean-Claude Van Damme would eventually make it to appear in a digitised fighting game of his very own, where he appeared in Street Fighter the movie The Game as Guile, which I guess is a rather peculiar twist to all of this. Like many fighting games, Mortal Kombat of course has bosses, including Goro, who we mentioned briefly when touching on the game's plot. Goro is a half-human, half-dragon beast creature with four arms to fight with. This also makes him impossible to throw. Obviously, unlike the other characters in the game, Goro is not a digitised actor, as I imagine it would probably be difficult to find a man with four arms somewhere. The sprite instead is based on a stop motion model, much like when beasts appeared in many movies of old prior to the CGI era. The game's main antagonist, who we have mentioned several times, is of course Shang Tsung, a powerful sorcerer with the ability to transform into many playable characters during the final battle, making him a bit different to opponents that came before him. Altogether, the game's characters, digitised graphics, violent content and unique fighting mechanics made Mortal Kombat a smash hit and one of the most talked about video games on the entirety of planet Earth. The brand went mainstream and everyone heard about it. Mortal Kombat cabinets were everywhere, arcades, pubs, kebab shops, bowling alleys, you name it, and this fun, gory game could be played by just about anyone. And despite the game's violent content, the game would still be heavily marketed towards children, as seen by this very early Mortal Kombat arcade poster. In fact, fast forward a bit to 1995, in my childhood we even had a Mortal Kombat children's cartoon, which I would regularly watch on the Fox Kids Network. Us 90s kids are a huge part of the target market for the game, and all the other children I knew adored the title, along with its fatality system, finding the absurdity of it all ridiculous and amusing. But at the same time, the game had a cool factor too. Of course, all the violence and gore openly marketed toward children would cause quite a stir, and the controversial action in this game would soon draw its fair share of detractors, with many people outraged enough to call for a ban on violent video game content altogether. Many were concerned that if children played violent video games, then they would go on to commit violent crimes in the real world. Parents, along with powerful public officials, such as Democrat Party members Joseph Lieberman and Herb Cole, would work together to try and bring about change. This would mean that by the end of 1992, 
the two Democrat senators would head a hearing on video game violence and their corruption of society. During this hearing, legislators would raise their concerns about video games that featured realistic replicas of human figures, such as Mortal Kombat, Night Trap, Doom and Lethal Enforcers, as opposed to the more traditional cartoonish characters we have mainly seen in violent games previously. Obviously, if you know anything about gaming history, you will be more than aware that Night Trap was not even a particularly violent game, and instead offers a full motion video, house intruder story, that is arguably even tamer than the bloody Home Alone movies, some of the most popular kids films of the era. But rather than a young Macaulay Culkin alone in the house, it did involve a large group of teenage girls as victims. This would lead to Lieberman claiming that the game featured gratuitous violence and promoted sexual aggression against women, even though later in the hearing he admitted that he had not even played Night Trap, one of the very games he was trying to have banned. A man who played a role in Night Trap's release known as Tom Zito was enraged by Lieberman's lack of research and twisting of the truth, and would try to explain some of the context of the game, but was reportedly completely silenced in his attempts. To clarify, Night Trap features no nudity, no extreme acts of violence, and the player's role is to save the young women in the house. In other words, the game had no business even being part of this debate. Despite the hearing being full of holes, with the games in question certainly not being looked at fairly or properly, big changes were made to the gaming industry following these events. I guess when it comes to politics in the United States of America, if you have enough money behind you, you can pretty much do whatever you want, with the unfair attack against Night Trap being a prime example of this. The hearing would result in the entire entertainment software industry being given one year to form a working rating system, or the federal government would intervene and create its own system. Eventually, the Entertainment Software Ratings Board (ESRB) was conceived, requiring all video games to be rated and for these ratings to be placed on games packaging. To be honest, despite many of the elements presented in the case being totally unfair, I think long term this rating system was certainly needed, particularly when you take into account how realistic games will become in years to come. After all, if movies, music and TV shows have a rating system, then it only makes sense for video games to be treated the same way. But the hyperbole regarding violent games breeding violent people is just plain nonsense. In the hearing's defence though, at least, I think it's perfectly valid to consider children's brains not necessarily developed enough to be exposed to certain scenes in games or movies. No one wants any young minds traumatised after all. Whilst Lieberman would defeat video games and popular culture on this occasion, his crusade would not even come close to ending here. Fast forward to the dawn of the millennium and the man had grown so powerful that he was running for Vice President of the United States, serving under Al Gore in his election battle against George Bush Jr. We all know how this one ended, with Bush controversially picking up the win by the skin of his teeth. Amusingly today though, some actually blame Lieberman for Gore's narrow loss, due to the man continuously championing censorship and pioneering cancel culture. Lieberman, along with the parents American Television Council, despised the general direction American culture was going in, hating the rise of shows like South Park and Jerry Springer. On multiple occasions, they would criticise the rise of sex, violence and bad words on television, and would actively go out of their way to try and cancel the WWF Attitude Era, even causing the company to have to tone down their content via putting pressure on large companies such as Coca-Cola to stop sponsoring the brand. WWF would even parody their behaviour through a hated villain group in the promotion known as the Right to Censor, with commentary even referencing on occasion that Joe Lieberman would be right at home with the Right to Censor group. Considering how influential pro wrestling was at the time, and how attacked pro wrestling fans felt they were by the wannabe vice president, it is very possible that these events would have helped swing the election in George Bush's favour. As stated earlier in the video, if you have enough money in the USA, you pretty much have the power to make whatever you want happen. You don't mess with Vincent Kennedy McMahon, and the censorship of Mortal Kombat, Night Trap, 
and the WWF would eventually turn around to bite Lieberman in the arse. So at least there is a happy ending to this attack against gamers and later wrestling fans. Speaking of the WWF Attitude Era censorship battle, it is documented in detail by Justin Wang, so if you want to learn more about this fiasco, I advise you go check his video out on the subject. Since we've gone a little off track focusing on how the censorship fiasco would progress, I guess it is time to get back to talking about Mortal Kombat itself. 1993 would see the game ported to a number of home consoles, with the new certification system now in place. The game would be released on both Sega and Nintendo platforms, with the Nintendo games varying drastically from their Sega counterparts. Whilst the Super Nintendo version of the game featured stronger visuals and audio, the blood and gore had been removed from the game, amusingly being replaced with sweat. The reason for this was in line with Nintendo's family-friendly policies, rather than due to certification. There was at least one saving grace for fans though, as the sweat could be changed back to blood in the game with the use of a Game Genie code. The Mega Drive version of the game thankfully did feature blood, and even completely uncensored fatalities, but these could only be accessed via the use of a cheat code. This conversion of the game was given an MA13 rating by the Video Game Rating Council. Eventually the game would end up being ported to a number of other systems too, with perhaps the Sega Mega CD version being the best of the bunch, offering the Mortal Monday commercial as part of the game's introduction, and completely uncensored content without the requirement of any codes. The CD version had a closer gameplay resemblance to the arcade than anything released previously, but featured a remixed CD audio track to help enhance the action further. The accuracy of this game would result in an MA17 rating. So after going back and looking at the past of this game, there is no denying that Mortal Kombat was a unique, innovative game that would change the course of history in so many different ways. Not only did the outrage that this game generate result in a rating system being implemented into US gaming, but you could argue that it bolstered Joe Lieberman's beliefs in censorship, which would play an active role in the downfall of Al Gore, resulting in George Bush's presidency, resulting in the search for weapons of mass destruction that didn't exist, resulting in the formation of ISIS. I know that's a lot of tedious links, but without Mortal Kombat we may never have seen any of this unfold. What an outrage, eh? So ladies and gentlemen, that was the mad story of Mortal Kombat and why it caused outrage. If you would like me to do a deep dive on Mortal Kombat 2, then express your interest down in the comment section below. You can subscribe to receive multiple videos on gaming history every single week, so why not check out one of my playlists for content of this ilk. Special shout outs go out to those who support this channel on Patreon, making projects like this possible for everyone to see. Special thank yous go out to Sebastian Velez, Carl Johnson, The Murder of Crows, Heo, Paula Lopez, Joseph Rasmek, Luke, Samuel Denton, Corey I. Marsh Sr., Capcom vs. SNK, BXL Gotham, Rowan Dinched, Evan Border, Philip Manth, Cambo Rambo82, Azra Rorakai, Keith Ferguson, Joplin Varela, Prince Knight, Michael Cullix, Ago, Jordan Durant, TOG Driver, Angel Eye 85, Alephia Swanson, Timothy W. Haskins II, Nick Daniels, Princess Zana, Glenny Glenn, Daniel Daly, Computer Man, House of the Ted, Sponge Matt B, Gary Pinkett, ECU Professor, Justin Wang, Aaron McNamara, Instant Gratification Monkey, Man Shovel, James Bishop, JB, Posty XL, Michael Hall, Wesley Sang He, Ben Slightly, Langston Miller, New, Brian Barry, Stephen Lewis, Sarah Powell, Flaming Rene, Marvin Araliga, Chris Cole, Adrian Hannington, Bernard NG, Richard Stu Stewart, James McDonald, Crazy Yarl, Dan Van Dammit, Adam Castin, Louis Fiant, John Bates, David Bale, Chris Fisk, Paul Elliott, Me Machine Dean, Mike Bruno, Rick67, Antonio Rodriguez, Hans Christian, Craig Jenkins, Tom Elliott, Retroverse.com, Casey Wright, Synth Spaces, Zai, Andrew Bazansky, Gunther Hendrick, and everyone else who supports me in producing these videos. I love you long time. Yeah. Cheerio.